So it's really exciting to bring um, together a fantastic panel to talk about how technology is changing the professions and how the coronavirus has accelerated that. So to introduce our panel, um, we are joined by Brige Kearney, uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Assets. We're also joined by Fraser Campbell, who's the UK Head of Accounts and Business Advisory Services, also at Assets. Um, I'm delighted to have Richard Kemp with us. Uh, Richard is a seasoned IT lawyer and founder of Kemp IT Law. And of course, we've got Ben uh, Ben Kent from Meridian West. Um, the first question um, I'd like to put to our panel, um, and Fraser, I'm going to put this one to you to kick off with, is um, I just thought it'd be quite interesting just to sort of touch on what are the driving uh, forces behind the adoption of technology in professional services? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks, Matt. I think from where we sit, uh, dealing primarily with owner-managed SMEs um, across the UK, what we're seeing, particularly in the last 10 years, is the rise of cloud technologies. So there's a technology driver. Um, so that's been driven primarily by the software um, companies like uh, Xero and, and QuickBooks, as everybody will be aware of. That in itself is also kind of intersecting with what I would view as a general consumerization of consumption. Um, so, so what you see is when you're looking to to buy pretty much anything these days as a consumer, the um, the, the the internet and and you know e-marketing, e-commerce is the place to go. Clearly, during COVID, that's accelerated. But that consumerization of consumption is now moving into business services as well. And I think the software players have got a lot, a lot to account for that for for that move. And finally, there's there's a third there's a third kind of um, uh, factor, particularly in the UK, which is regulation. So HMRC is is pushing uh, again primarily small to medium sized businesses down the technology route in, in, in line with their making tax digital. Um, campaign. So, so there's there's various factors at play there, which and I just see that starting to accelerate over over the coming years. Um, Richard, um, to pick up on that theme, I mean uh, the drivers there are, seem to be from the technology companies, from uh, the regulators themselves. Uh, what role is the client playing in driving this kind of, this technology? I, I think you can look at this from from two points of view. You've got the sort of demand side um, and the supply side. On, on the demand side. Um, in our world, which is the law firm world, it's just characterized by competition. Um, and everybody is looking to get a cost or a service advantage from tech. Um, and it's particularly rich at the moment, maybe not at such scale as it was you know, with the adoption of Word and the internet all those years ago. Um, but you are um, sort of trying to harness all these things, cloud AI data, digital transformation, digital commerce, to give your um, business a competitive advantage over the guy down the street. And I think we start to see that getting into um, uh, in, in the in-house world as well, where the adoption of tech has been a lot quicker in-house in the last couple of years than, than, than previously. Um, so that's the demand side, and then the supply side is just that these these fourth industrial revolution trends that we're seeing. Mm. Yeah. Um, Matt, maybe I sort of chip in here because we've done a lot of research with buyers, you know, of accountancy and legal services. And I think what we're seeing is definitely an impetus for change um, in the legal sector. I think it's very much driven by the very large in-house legal departments, particularly those in banks and insurance businesses. And they're not just seeing this as an opportunity to drive down the costs of legal services, but really to use data in a much more imaginative way about how they can manage their supply chain, but also how they can use data analytics to look at risks within their bank and to looking to transform that in, in-house legal function. So I think they see it as, as quite an exciting time to really add value to the business. I was going to ask Brige, um, as, our, as the marketing expert here on our panel, um, how is it changing the way firms go to market? Is, is um, to, uh, Richard mentioned, uh, giving firms that competitive advantage. Is that something something that is then reflected in marketing and the way firms go to market? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. I mean, I, I would look at our own business and I think the adoption of technology has probably spurred our transformation, transformation forward by probably 18 months. Um, and I think there, there are four things I would look at within that. Um, the first being that um, 
it's all about data, as you as you said, Ben. You know, it, it's turning that rich data into insights, which obviously then are turned into fantastic content that has to be relevant and um, distributed at a time when our clients and prospects need it. So I think technology really has driven that forward. Um, and the second the second point is really in terms of the digital stack. So making sure that um, you know you've got the right foundations in place. But how do you think? Um... The, the, the pandemic will shape the adoption um, of technology in the coming months. And um, Richard, maybe um, we'll come to you first. Yeah, I, I just as one one big point here in, in the law firm world, which is that you know, everybody now realizes how important tech is. Um, I think a year ago or two years ago, sort of you, you'd have probably quite a high proportion of the sort of senior partner cadre at the big firms for whom technology was important and interesting, exciting, but not really for them. It was for someone else. It was for the junior guys. It was for the for these business support groups that we seem to be spending a lot on bigging up, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. The last year has brought it home to everyone how central and critical it is. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, you've got the obvious things like Accelerant and Zoom and Teams and, and things, but I think that just kind of, it, it's got into everybody's consciousness that this is for, for everyone, it's a must. Mm -hmm. um, Fraser, how do you um, see sort of a post-COVID landscape looking at, with technology platforms and professional services firms? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think coming on from Richard's point that that general acceptance by everybody from, you know, every shape and size of client uh, that we act for and 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 every every member of our team realised that, that technology is a huge enabler. I think, however, there's also been a kind of a, a realisation that technology is not the only solution to delivering um, uh, end to end uh, relevant services to our clients. Um, and, and there's a realization that, that, that technology is is a tool, and what we need to do is find a way of, of wrapping around the people, processes, go to market that that, that sit around the technology core, um, in order to deliver uh, you know good outcomes and, and good services for our clients. So so I think the pandemic has actually been a catalyst in terms of a realization that you don't just adopt technology for technology's sake, but you need to look at it in the context of of the wider service. Uh, propositions that you take take to market. It, one, one, it strikes me one of the, the rather nice things about the professional services uh, sector is you've got some very large firms and a huge draft of quite small firms. There must be a real challenge for some of those smaller firms um, when it comes to making investment in um, technology and the right technology. Uh, maybe Richard, any thoughts there at all? Will they be left behind as a result of this pandemic? Yeah, I, I, I think you've got sort of different types of technology. You've got the, the core tech that everyone uses. Again, in the law firm world, it's practice management systems, document management systems, CRM systems. And I think all firms are getting better at using those, mm -hmm. partly because there are more of them and they're more suited to different sizes in the marketplace. Um, I think it's where, where, where you're looking at sort of front of house things that, that, that it's more difficult for the smaller firms, perhaps. Um, although, you know, if you're a big firm, you don't really want to be on the bleeding edge. You know, you, 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 you want to try and get something when it's reached a good level of adoption. So someone else has taken the pain and good uh, and sort of medium sized firms are good at doing that. Yeah. Um, I was going to add to that, actually, Richard. I think you think you're right. Um, the size of the investment for smaller firms, you know, will negate where they're where they're going to be in the next ten years. There's a report recently that said, if uh, I think something like forty percent of businesses will die in the next ten years if they don't adopt the right technology and transformation. And certainly, I think what we're also seeing is some of those smaller firms now becoming part of that ecosystem of the QuickBooks of the world, where it's, you know, if, if you need more advisory help, then, then then you know, contact a local accountant. So I think it's completely changing, you know, it's almost become a little bit like this, the supplier in the Amazon um, space. And um, so I think, it, you know, there's a lot of probably partners and small businesses, you know, suddenly waking up to this. And, you know, also the, the, the fact that it's such a regulatory and legal, you know, challenging um, environment that actually a bit like the banks, as you said, 10 years ago, well, actually that can be online and it can equally be as good an experience as we were used to with the with the accountant of old, dare I call it that. 
I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? I think one of the things of technology has always been this promise of, of um, scale and allowing firms to achieve scale. But when you actually look at the market, it doesn't necessarily seem to ring true. I wonder why that might be, Fraser. Yeah, again, if I, if I look over the last 10 years and the rise of cloud technologies within the accounting space, you have dozens, if not hundreds of um, uh, purely digital firms out there who've embraced this technology fully. Um, we've yet to see one of them break through and really scale into a significant player in the market. Um, and, and having spoken to some of my colleagues in those those smaller firms, um, one of the, 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 the key reasons they cite, um, I'll use this word politely, is client drag. Um, what, that, what that really means is um, as a profession and as uh, as service providers, I don't think we've really cracked the value propositions that are there that we can deliver to our clients, which really makes them excited and enthusing about embracing the, 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 the benefits that technology can bring to them as individuals and businesses. So I don't think we've cracked that optimization piece yet and that value proposition. Once somebody cracks it, that will be the that will be the, the, the gateway to scaling because the value proposition, if you've built it in with the right infrastructure, will be scalable through technology. So um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Some are getting closer, I think, though. Yeah, and I, I would, I'd agree with Fraser. I think um, you're right, actually. I think lots of the technology which has been deployed has been kind of uh, to, back, to do back office or to do certain components of a piece of work. So due diligence, for example, We've seen what's been quite rare is kind of digital first type products, and I and I think um, even the, the some of the big four KPMG or Grant Thornton have attempted it but failed, and I think it's really under you know understanding your customer base and that value proposition. A lot of clients are kind of inherently anxious about moving to what they feel is a a kind of inhuman proposition, a kind of call center. And so you've got to, you need to give a lot of reassurance that technology will actually enhance the relationship and give you more access. It's like almost like the digital trusted advisor. It's quite interesting. A, um, a question has just been put in, which um, maybe Ben, you might want to pick on is, is actually where is where does technology sit? Is it there to enhance the client experience or, or is it there to protect revenues and things like that? And I wonder, how, when firms are looking at adopting technology, where are they starting from? Is it a defensive play or is it uh, to genuinely enhance client experience? Um, my personal view is I think it, it's often started off to do your back office and make them more efficient and then to maintain margins. Mm -hmm. I think you know, there's a big upfront cost in terms of both the technology and the adoption. So I think it takes several years for that um, to, to come in. I think though we're getting quite a lot of um, projects at the moment looking at how to in, use technology to enhance it. So we're doing a project with one of the world's largest private client law firms and to how to make that the, it's even more personalized in real time. And so I think that's what the really exciting piece is you still get access to the person, but you you have much more so digital access. You can get in touch with them at, at much faster. I mean, Richard, you're you're um, working with an awful lot of uh, firms buying technology. Where do, where do you see that relationship with firms sitting, um, and the and the reasons they are buying? What 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 do you see there? I, I, I think I think it depends on where the firm is in the value chain. Um, you know, there's a sort of constant theme that you've got to be scurrying up the down escalator as fast as your feet can carry you, because at the bottom of the escalator is marked commoditization and death for high value law, law, law firms, basically. Um, so and where does that leave you? And, and, and as Ben said, with the big firms at the top of the escalator, um, they, they will look at uh, technology to um, uh, uh, take costs out of repeatable standardized componentry of big deals, whether it's you know, buying a building and the property reports on title, e-discovery litigation, um, due diligence, as, as Ben has said. So I think I think it depends 
um, you, you've got to have a very clear idea first of where you are in the market mm-hmm. and, and, and how technology can help you. I mean, mass market stuff isn't going to help the city firms particularly for a while yet, um, but it will be helping the the the, um, the, the B2C firms, that sort of personal injury, um, conveyancing, wills, the, the personal work, maybe a, a level up from that now, um, the sort of SME work. But one of the questions I wanted to ask is sort of is 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 around the human perspective in technology, and I think this is something that perhaps the past twelve months have really brought home to us is the the value of the the, the of relationships. And is there a risk with professional services firms where people buy people that technology removes that? Um, from um, the relationships they have, and and how should firms uh, sort of approach that risk? Um, Fraser, maybe kick off with you there. Yeah, it's interesting. You kind of touched on it earlier about technology just being part of the mix of of, of a service that you deliver. Um, I, I think um, if I look at what I actually deliver for my clients, my portfolio that I still deal with, um, yes, we keep them the right side of regulation, HMRC, etc. But in reality, um, I, I'm, for some of them, I actually feel feel like I'm more of a life life coach, life partner, because um, your your accountant um, is is the is the person, particularly for a small business, that gets to see under the bonnet of, of your business, which is quite a personal thing for the owner manager, um, and the business is what drives all of their. Uh, well, resources to allow them to to you know raise their family, go on holiday, all of that good stuff. So people really are at the core of it. It's about um, delivering those outcomes, not just for a business in a hard business sense, but for the business owner as as well. Um, and and I think that is what the the saving grace is for for us professionals out there is while technology will allow us to take the more mundane, repeatable, boring tasks, get them done more efficiently, get better quality information. Ultimately, that allows us to make bet- help our clients make better decisions. And it's those decisions that have a direct impact on people's lives. And that's why I still get up uh, up in the morning is to make, have that impact in people's lives. It's not actually to make balance sheets balance despite what people think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Breach, how, how does that change um, uh, uh, the, the way you communicate those messages to clients? Is, is, is what, how, how does that sort of uh, shape the marketing, the business development, that the relationship is still there and technology is there to make it easier? Technology is perhaps not the answer in itself. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think it was Fraser who said it's definitely the enabler. And if I if I think of our experience over the last 12 months, and in particular, if I look at, say, the Chancellor's budget uh, recently, where we had uh, 1,200 uh, clients on one webinar, whereas, you know, 18 months ago, they would have been dotted all around our 80 different um, offices across the country with partners talking to them over breakfast, etc., has that changed that relationship bit? No, it, it's just meant that the follow-up has been interesting in terms of, you know, it, it can feel like there's your list, go and follow it up and, and go and talk to your clients. So we, we've, we've actually, um, I think it's made us more human in many ways because as, as Fraser said, you know, you're on Zoom calls with the dog barking in the background or trying to hide the kids under the table or, or whatever, or a glimpse into people's bedrooms. Um, and actually what we've found and, and, and the pandemic in that sense has, has definitely given us that sense of purpose around really helping our clients through this um, and from that in fact one client said that will be the legacy of mm-hmm. firms through this last 18 months and how actually you have helped clients as opposed to worry about the technology or the bottom line or whatever else and I know a lot of our people have gone way and beyond what they they would have probably done in in normal circumstances so I absolutely think that human relationship is probably going to be stronger than ever because we'll also have those stories to tell when we come out of this and we are back in coffee shops or over lunch or over drinks again um, so in terms of, yes, we will absolutely continue to use the technology because in some ways someone would probably, probably rather get in on a webinar and actually have that time back with their family rather than going to evening events or whatever. Um, and then I think going back to the second point, it is really around that data um, and making sure that we use the right data for our clients to drive those insights in a really human way with a really human message. Gee, um, Richard, is there a danger that as we um, uh, move on from the COVID pandemic, our memories are always, they always seem to me remarkably short, that actually the lessons that we've learnt over the past 12 months and and the next 12 months might be forgotten? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I'm, I'm a great believer in technology as as a scientist that empowers what we do. Um, 
I don't think that's going to go away. And I think this the, the pandemic has actually made us realize sort of humanly you know, just what we can do with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, it you know, I think it's going to sort of lead to people assembling the resources that they need for a business in an easier way than has been done by now. So, you know, you, you, you're, you're not sort of, you don't have to go into the building and see someone at their desk. You, know, you, can, you can just call them up and speak to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to, to sort of help this m- much more agile way of, of working. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of having thought about this. I mean, I know we've got problems with you know, everyone's on Zoom and Teams and all this sort of stuff, but I think the benefits they give and the way you can mediate it, particularly when you get back into it, gives you much more choice. Um, I've got um, some questions that were shared with me in advance. Um, so I have a, a question for you all. Um, what technology are you most excited about or perhaps most optimistic about um, in shaping um, the, the professions? Um, ben, why don't I start with you? Yeah, I think in the, the legal sector, I think um, contract automation is probably the technology that is potentially most transformational. I think it's um, been used for quite a few years now, decades actually, for so sort of simple NDAs or kind of swap type agreements. But uh, it's now it's getting a lot more sophisticated. So um, you know, technology such as Clarilist can look at whole suites of contracts, and I think that has that has a transformational, mm-hmm. potentially transformational impact. And um, Fraser. Um, excited technology. Um, I, I'm going to be a little bit boring about this one. See, I, I'm still just as excited about the cloud technologies that were there maybe five years ago as I am today about them. Um, because what I do see is when, when they're, they're embraced in a positive and constructive way, uh, particularly for businesses that are looking to challenge themselves and grow. Um, the, the sm- you know, businesses of turnovers of less than a million looking to scale, they have unrivaled access to the type of ERP systems that were only the preserve of enterprises just five years ago. So that still excites me. Uh, we're still pretty early in that journey uh, and, and really I'm excited about helping those SMEs and scaling businesses embrace what's currently there and making the most of it. Brige, um anything that really excites you? Um, I'd, I'd agree with Fraser on that. I, I think that the cloud technology is still really exciting, but I think beyond that, I'm actually really excited about all the, the, the social media technology that's out there and how that's going to help us, um, I think, get a lot closer to our, our clients and our customers. And actually, it, it's not just about sharing content, but really communicating with them and having the ability to listen. So things like Workspace, you know, Clubhouse, the new one that's the, you know, the, sort of the audio workspace is really exciting. And those opportunities just to, to get online and collaborate and listen to clients, I think, is just really exciting. Richard. I, I want to see what augmented reality can do for uh, teaching and learning and a lot of these things that we sort of absorb by osmosis in the law. Actually, in virtual augmented reality situations are going to become easier. There's a whole plethora of tech vendors out there um, that are desperate to try and sell to people just like you. Um, what can they do to grab your attention when there are so many new technologies out there and, and new technology seemingly emerging every other week? Um, Fraser, I'm going to come to you. Um, they don't have to try too hard to grab my attention. Whether that attention will turn into action is another question altogether. Um, I, I think it really comes down to um, the the relevance to the the uh, propositions and, and outcomes we were trying to achieve for our clients when we look at what we're trying to do we always start with with the client and understand what it is they want us to deliver for them so so those technology vendors need to start with that mindset either with us as a client or or our clients in mind in terms of how they can enhance our value proposition there so so that's that's what i would say to that there uh, matt richard presumably a similar sort of answer Yes, um, I mean, we're a Microsoft shop, which sort of removes that question. We're probably not high on people's lists. Um, I think I think I think just discipline, you know, what what can you as the vendor 
in a disciplined way offered to your professional services client. Is actually, will where will the big technology changes come from? Will they come from within the professions? Will it be clever lawyers, clever accountants developing new technology? Or will it be from the very large technology companies that have uh, evolved out completely outside of um, the professions, the Googles and the Amazons and the like? I, I wonder if there's any thoughts there. Um, Again, Richard, why don't I come to you and then we'll we'll do a quick round the room before we wrap up. Yes, just um, just very, uh, very, very quickly. L law firms are not concerned with 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 the scale of tech. They're concerned with how it affects them and their clients. You've probably got someone outside the law firm world who can take that 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 sort of uh, market view L legal services are notoriously difficult to sell into so you, you probably have someone with a foot in either camp um it it, it it may be a big four it may be someone that we haven't heard about it may be you know such, 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 someone in india but i would doubt that the big driving change would come from within the law firm world it would probably come from outside and um, bridge uh, final thought from you yeah, I, I would agree with Richard on that. Um, I think it, what we are seeing is it, it. you almost have to have that entrepreneurial outside in view on how to solve problems. And I think, you know, the, the skills gap within the traditional professional services is just not there. Um, and in fact, either to develop those technologies or, um, you know, we're finding that the minute even trying to recruit people in from a marketing perspective with those skill sets is, is quite challenging um, in terms of being able to really pivot. So I think, yeah, I think that innovation will come from outside. Mm -hmm. And then it's about the opportunity to grasp that and, and to think that outside in thinking. Ben. Yeah, I, th I think what's interesting, I think um, we're beginning to kind of get, I think there's a the hype around the sort of almost like a dot com hype is kind of over now. And I think we might see a lot of the kind of boutique software is kind of going out of, of going out of business and um, a few kind of dominant players emerging. And they'll be very clear about making sure that they've got good APIs and integrate. So I think quite soon actually we'll have almost a kind of market wide platform that pretty much everyone uses for contract management or accounting. And then it will be really about how you make sure your software kind of links up with that. And I think that that will be the point at which professional services flips and it suddenly takes off. And um, Fraser, a final word from you. Um, what Ben said, um, <laughs> you know, I, I agree. I, th I think that the, the innovation that, that us as an accounting profession needs to take now is is harnessing the power of what we've already got. Mm -hmm. um, the, the the development of the tech um, has has up to now come from outside the firms, but if what it has been is a, is a you know an amalgam of people with some subject matter expertise who might have been accountants in their past lives with uh, who have a technology view with the technology entrepreneurs coming together that have created the, the successes thus far um, and, and that kind of mix is in my view how that uh, how innovation will continue uh, for, for our profession and um, but really it's down to us as the professionals to now to grasp hold of it and, and, and as Ben says um, harness the the opportunities that, that it gives us, because I don't think we've really done that yet. Um, so that's what I'm really excited about for the coming five, five or so years.